specifically going to share my most recent research and application of those ideas as they relate to cognition, geolocation, and its application to a specific build that my company that I work with is going to be releasing in the next couple of weeks. Um, this is sort of a different talk for me, by the way. Uh, I've been writing a chapter for a book, and this is actually part of the manuscript. Uh, so I, I have the manuscript with me, and I'm using it to read from, uh, which I've, I've never done before, to be completely honest. So here I am flying without a net. Um, so uh, I might be jumping in and out of this a little bit as I move along, but uh, I, I think I have some decent ideas to present to you today, uh, and we'll all learn something new. So um, with that, I'd like to share some of the influences that have guided my practices. So I had the great fortune of being the child of two teachers. My mom and dad uh, and sister, we moved through the yearly schedule of classes. Um, we had holiday breaks, Easter gatherings, and finally the blessings of summer. And uh, for most kids like us in rural Illinois, uh, the blessings of summer meant summer camp, swimming, and hours of riding our bikes uh, unsupervised through our miniature town of Grandy Tour. And uh, our village boasted no police, a uh, volunteer fire department, and plenty of opportunities to explore and get into amazing amounts of trouble. Uh, inevitably, there would be an interruption of this unbridled schedule uh, as we quickly move from the elation of being free of stifling classrooms to the punctuations of lows where my parents would have to endure me saying for the 10,000th time that I was bored and that there was nothing to do. So the monotony would always be broken by a summer journey. And my parents traveled quite a bit. They took some vacations by themselves, and sometimes they went to Chicago, other times to friends, a random festival or retreat across the country. However, there was always the family summer trip. And uh, like all the others they took, they would inevitably be navigated in the largest car that was in our ragtag inventory, the old 98, which we called the boat. Um, this was sort of the normal middle class summer vacation. And regardless of our well-worn ride, I never really wanted for anything beyond the normal things that boys would have wanted at the age of 13. A motorcycle, new books, new comic books, or maybe the new Van Halen album. I did manage to score some of these things, but overall our financial situation definitely dictated the method and means of our travel. Flying was out, and road tripping was definitely in. So, summer tips, trips with our fiscal conservancy meant long drives with lots of camping, and uh, we had traveled to quite a few places over the previous years. And every summer meant one trip to my grandmother and aunt's home in North Dakota. And that trip was actually pretty easily, normally ending up being a warm up for the next outing of the summer. And the reality is that we had a pretty good system. Uh, we'd rig up the large car with a pop up camper and load up the roof rack. And then my mom would take my sister and I to the store and we'd provision ourselves Lewis and Clark style with. Um, the most disgusting junk foods we could find. And I had a particular interest, actually, in aerosol cheese. Um, we never really had it at home, and I think it was my effort to get in the idea of mobile food at an early age, so call me a prepper. Inevitably, cheese in a can would end up with me shooting it straight into my mouth like some type of addict, and a cracker based less consumption straight to a non-cheese food product speedball. My mother would also make sure that we had brought a bin of extra books, uh, toys and games and other diversions so that my sister Jane and I did not move across the closely guarded DMZ of the center console of the Olds 98. During those trips, I also became enamored, enamored with the Atlas and uh, that would help us chart our progress, okay? So I realized that I was unwittingly figuring out the process of reverse lookup. And uh, I went from tables of letters and numbers and that would relate back to locations on the pages in the maps and this was important to me because I wanted to also sort of track where we were. So I'd look over at the speedometer and calculate how long it would be until we'd get to a location. And uh, it always got a little bit harder when they decided to drive over 65. The math was a bit, a bit more difficult. So in this particular year, though, it was 1981. And my parents had announced that we were heading south to Florida. So Jane and I discussed the agenda. And it really didn't sound too bad. Um, we'd have a chance to get to the beach and possibly to Bush Gardens, paradise. So now given that we are from Illinois, we had some experience with weather extremes. However, once we left northern Illinois and the car moved south and east, we <laughs> learned a whole new level of uncomfortable. And some of you may know that the country was 
uh, particularly hot in the summer of 1981. It was on a blazing bender that had been going on for about two years. So we were dealing with average temperatures of about this on a consistent level. So we suffered through quite a few you know, sweaty days in the camper, and that had us begging to get back into the Land Cruiser with the AC blasting and getting about 10 miles the gallon when gas was in an unreasonable 88.9 cents per gallon. So we had crossed into Florida, and we were mercifully heading towards the coast and the beach. Then it hit us. We had been culturally duped again. You see, my parents were consummate educators, and what had begun as a kidrific trip to the beach um, with slushies, roller coasters, dolphin shows was actually bound by a Faustian deal that was not made but bound to us by a mother and father with love of art, culture, and history. So the first stop, of course, in Old Fort, at St. Augustine. And here I am, and you can see how excited I am to arrive at the old fort in Florida. So, you know, I should have known. I should have expected it. It happened before when we went further northeast and we're supposed to be visiting one of my favorite cousins, only be detoured to the Freedom Trail in Boston, and then the battlefields of Gettysburg. So here's the problem. St. Augustine would be another empty building with a history that I can neither see nor touch. The guide would say, like they did at Gettysburg, look at the mound of dirt over there and imagine Pickett running towards it with 15,000 men, who, all of whom were slaughtered. So as a 13-year-old, I had a hard time conjuring what was probably this vivid scene. And uh, when I would pivot left and right, there were smooth planes and didactic panels that would describe the stories and preserve the, the memory the, of this place. And our stop at this fort was no different. Battlements and cannon placements at Castillo de Marcos was another place to wander through, engaging and interesting, but not nearly as exciting to me as the next water park. Now, we eventually did get to Bush Gardens, and my parents broke down from the heat. We got to stay in a hotel with ice machine in the pool, so all ended well. I don't think I was like dragged through this childhood uh, and miserable. That's not the case at all. And life was good. You know, I often reflect on these times as an adult. And I wonder if I'm doing my own child justice and I'm providing her with a balance of fun and education. So I reflect on these visits because they informed who I am as a creator. And um, I've crafted a research process that pulls together learning theory, creative production, and emerging technology. So for the past 20 years, I've worked as a creative professional, as a creative director for the last 10, and as an academic for the last 15. And my endeavors have moved me firmly into the areas of mobile learning and mediated educational experiences. So I've designed for about every platform that's out there. Um, and, uh, but the most exciting thing for me of recent and, and of late has been the growth and the maturation of the mobile learning space. And so for the past three years, um, in addition to my research at Bradley, I work as a principal at Float Mobile Learning. And at Float, we've had the opportunity to build some stuff. And these are three tools that we built over the last couple of years. The first is Tapestry, which is a social learning tool, which basically allowed you to tag learning events, and you could share those out with your social networks. And you can see that it would create sort of this rich tapestry, this listing of events that you could sort through. The second, which is Sandbox, um, which is an application which uh, just sort of provides a mediated browsing experience. So if you wanted to deploy it in your organization and, and whitelist a specific uh, set of websites, you could do that. And then finally, Ravel Browser, which is a shared browsing experience where you can push content to multiple tablets in real time. So uh, we've had about 50,000 downloads of the apps in this suite of offerings. And uh, Chad Udell is my creative partner, and he's also a principal at Float. Um, he wrote a book called Learning Everywhere. Um, he's a good friend of mine. And we spend a lot of time talking about the things that we like to build. And luckily, we work at a place where the owners of the company, we don't own it, entertain our uh, flights of fancy as we try to think of new ways in which people are going to learn. And so this method of learning, you know, this sort of this mantra of sort of providing opportunities for content but not really creating a learning management system is something that centers uh, a lot of our work. And uh, with these applications, you know, there were different themes with them. And what Chad and I have been talking about are the ways in which place is really crucial to the learning process. And sort of how does that mash with the affordances of the device, portability, ubiquity, connectivity, and all the things that the new learning platform has that's distinct from the other educational channels that are out there. So uh, many of the solutions that I create are for business. Um, but they do have a wider application. 
And I was brought back to those car trips, and I began to think about why those trips had such a major impact on my life, and why I remembered the historical elements of those trips so much better than the social studies lectures on Franz Ferdinand that had happened in my classroom in the same year. Well, I think it's because the reason and the impact of the place sort of being, you know, what's known as in situ to the physicality and the situational references of the location has this effect where the places fit into the narrative of my life, the narrative of my childhood. They are part of a storyline. They are part of my personal cognitive experience. And so some people um, in psychological fields, they would call this implotment, where a set of complex events come together as a single story. So you know, hold on with me for a second. We're going to begin with some cognitive stuff. And uh, you know, cognitive structures, um, it's said, you know, provide meaningful experiences by relating their elements as part of a pattern. So we create constructs and structures that allow us to relate experiential things. And elements are usually sort of put into two categories, okay? The spatial and the temporal, okay? Where they're located and when they happened. So with spatial organization, there's usually a topology, all right? So think about this room. There's a spatial organization of the room. There's a front of the room, there's a back of the room, there's a left, the right, up, down, roof, floor, whatever, okay? And that's, that's the way we organize the space. With temporal organization, it's usually thought of as being serial, right? Like an event, an event, an event, an event, a unit of measure, a second, it ticks by. And clocks and chronological tools, you know, allow us to measure sort of those lengths of time in between events, and we begin to think about them as a linear timeline. But the, the interesting thing is, like our experience doesn't happen or doesn't appear to happen to us as sort of a succession of nows or a series of dots. So when we think about things, um, time is not sort of an undifferentiated conscious flow. It's punctuated by the things that are important to us. So, you know, these are things that I would think about, you know, my first day of school, my first bike at 15, you know, and there's the uniformity in the way these things are appearing, like in this graphical representation, but the magnitude is really different. So time does not appear as sort of this undifferentiated conscious flow. So it used to be, it used to be that philosophers, psychologists, they would, they would say that we would perceive things from a consciousness of observation you know, we would sort of remove ourselves, and that's sort of like the clock idea. But as we move forward, this idea of embodiment becomes more and more important, and that's sort of the primacy of the experience. And so it's what some people would call the flesh of the world, all right? Our corporality, who we are, where we are, really does determine our experiences and how we perceive everything, and subsequently how we sort of want to digest information and how we want that information organized. So with, um, with this idea, you know, our awareness of space is dependent upon the relationship of the objects within the space. So how much time does it take up in our sort of awareness? And some people call this thickness, okay? What is the thickness of the event? So like I got my first bike, I think, like, you know, I was like seven, I can remember it was an orange Huffy, you know, it was a BMX, and I was so excited. I can, I can vividly remember it being like in the room, in my living room as I woke up in the morning. My parents had surprised me. It was only one day in the month of September, which if you were to think about it, if you look at it from the other perspective, it's just one marker, right? But the thickness of the event, the relevance of it to me, the, visually the magnitude is much more important. And I think that's something that I keep coming back to all the time because it's a reinforcement and, and, and uh, the reason why these mobile devices are going to be so powerful and integrate into our lives. So, you know, in short, the learning is personal and, and learning is localized to our perception and point of view. And our brains are wired in a way that we really do manipulate this time stream. And, uh, we, we sort of change what we think we know based upon what we're proximal to, and uh, so when we're near it, and uh, that thickness is what helps it stick in our mind. So I begin to think about that as a creative and how I can use this device to enhance that. And this is really just experiential learning, and it's something we're all involved with in different capacities of what we do of our educational lives. And at the heart of it, I want to 
I want to talk about the ways that I get, I share, and I store my own learning in these patterns and based on what's important to me, what's important to me. So the affordances of mobile devices are extraordinary and they open up a world of possibilities. And um, the, the work that I want to share with you is, is sort of what is the design pattern, what are the, what are the consistent things that we're seeing all the time inside these apps um, that take into account not just the representation of data, because we've been doing that for a very long time, but the data in the way that it impacts me. And the social networks, in a lot of ways, are uh, tools that inherently create filters about what's important to us, right? So they're discrete from push content. Um, and we make decisions at the head end about what's important to us, what will be filtered, what is going to have relevance into the thickness of our lives. Like, we only invite those that we have a personal, casual, or business interest with, and we use it as a, make sure, as a method to make sure our reviews are centered around our personal experiences. And so we, we step back again. It always comes back to point of view and the relationship of the self to other information. Um, so the structuring of point of view is the key for me when I look at designing specific patterns and how we dissect, comprehend, categorize, and prior prioritize the information. And so what's happening now is that there's really been a codification of how we learn and how we can create a pattern set that supports that learning. And um, I think that it's helpful to know about the building blocks of these specific tools. And that's the topological thing that we talked about with the room, you know, up, down, left, and right, and to understand the constructors. And the constructors for these geolocated experiences are really also based in the technology. So it's, it's important that we understand how the systems actually work. And again, full disclosure, like I'm a designer. Like I went to graduate school, I did narrative theory, I did interactive design, I did cognitive theory, I did art, and then I just learned the technology as I go along. And when, the, you know, when we started getting into doing mobile design, it was like, it, it, it was so amazing to me about the, th the things that I had to learn and relearn and really begin to understand in a new way. So, some of this you may already know, um, but I'll share it with you, and maybe it'll fit in your portfolio and be part of your quiver. But um, so geolocation, you know, the idea of tagging information, um, putting information to a place, and uh, some people do call this disruptive technology, but I think it's, it's sort of part of who we are now. Um, but basically how it works is, you know, you got a phone and you got a SIM card, right? And your SIM card is your personal key that lets you operate on your cellular network, okay? That's what you subscribe, subscribe to and you pay all that money to on a monthly basis. And then inside the phone, you have a Wi-Fi adapter that allows you to collect, you know, connect to Wi-Fi or YLAN networks. And then an antenna, which amplifies or attenuates the signal, dials it into a specific frequency. And then finally, you usually would have a GPS chip that pulls signals from satellites or other broadcast sources. And then the combination of these things um, really is what forms our ability to do geolocation. And there are, there are essentially about four types of geolocation. And my talk, again, is going to center mostly on iOS devices because I'm trying to stick within one construct. So the different ways in which your phone tells you where you are include geo, GPS geolocation, Wi-Fi geolocation, cell tower geolocation, and possibly near-field geolocation. So near-field communication is most, of, most often referenced through um, the idea of uh, active or passive RFID. And, uh, you know, the passive RFID chip, does anyone know how small the smallest RFID chip can be for passive communication? Does anyone have an idea? Bigger than a bread box? <laughs> it's about a millimeter, actually, okay? And that chip um, can most likely be read um, in a passive form uh, of about you know, five to 10 meters is, is sort of the published specification. An active RFID chip, one that's powered, okay, can be read from a little bit further. And um, there's also a really interesting thing, too, with uh, active RFID. They're actually now doing micro geolocation with active RFID, where basically people will take um, two near field antennas and they'll sort of cross them by axially. And then you can actually move your phone and track your phone's position down to a millimeter. 
So people are using their phones actually as control devices for computers and things like that. So it's pretty interesting. It's a, it's a different way to think about geolocation. It's sort of geolocation in microspace as opposed to thinking where, where you are in the world. So um, Wi-Fi geolocation is also interesting because that actually uses like the SSIDs of routers, all right? So there has to be a lookup table of where all these routers exist, and then they can sort of begin to dial in where you are. Published specification for that, again, is about two to three kilometers. In reality, that too is a lot closer than what they say. And then finally, you know, geolocation um, from satellites. I got behind on my deck here. I have to catch up a little bit. Um, which is what we traditionally think of, um, sort of public satellites, private satellites, military satellites. There's probably a lot of satellites out there we don't really know about, and we might not really want to know about. Um, but uh, the published specifications, um, you know, they will range anywhere from three meters to 100 meters, and then the military sats, well, um, they're a lot tighter than that, and that's actually classified. They don't really publish it, but um, you know the the things anecdotally people read about. You know, it's like one you know like one foot resolution essentially that that they're being able to get to. So um, we more normally are working with sort of the public uh, GPS signals that are being piped out, um, and uh, that's what we base most of our assumptions on. So you know, here's how sort of the geolocation uh, signals work for GPS. There are sort of three major components of a GPS signal. The first part is the date and time, okay? The satellite status, you know, is it running? And then the second part is the orbital information, which they call ephemeris data. And that allows the receiver to figure out the position of the satellite. And then the third part of the signal is the almanac, okay? Which is the corpus of information about the entire network. So, the ephemeris information is really detailed, and it's only valid for about three or four hours at a time. And the almanac information is more general and is considered valid to be for valid for about uh, about six months on average. And um, the almanac sort of helps the receiver determine which satellites to look for. And then once the receiver picks up the satellite, it downloads all the other ephemeris data. So there's like this, okay, where am I in the network? And now pull down the details about the network. So a positional fix using any satellite uh, cannot be calculated until the receiver has an accurate and complete copy of that satellite's ephemeris data. If the signal from a satellite is lost while its ephemeris data is being acquired, the receiver must decide to start. Each frame contains, it takes 12.5 minutes. This is where my design team usually just zones off on me. Um, <laughs> And uh, they wanted me to include this message in because I practiced the talk with them. So, okay, here's, what, here's the reality. Um, okay, it, it takes about 12 and a half minutes for all that data to get down. If you were to like just sit and not use any adaptive networks, it would take 12 and a half minutes based on the, the transmit rate, the frame cell rate of what's coming down from the satellites to figure out where you are. So why is this important? Well, it's important because we have to think about how we're getting update information. Now, luckily, you know, 12 and a half minutes would be a long time. And we spend some time talking about time to first fix, or TTFF. Um, and there's this great thing that sort of developed, which is AGPS. And AGPS actually uses the cellular networks to kick out all of the almanac information. And that's what allows us when we, like, turn location services on, like, it happens right away. And if you had sort of first generation GPS devices, you would find that there was this really long time where it would, it would have to sort of acquire the signals, figure out where you are. And that was based on that combination of almanac and ephemeris information. So now with like a GPS tied to this, and all the networks use this, all your phones use this, um, the information isn't downloaded by satellite and we can get positioned also when sort of GPS signals are really weak. And we know that GPS signals don't always get, you know, inside of buildings really well, like line of sight becomes, can become extremely important. Um, so this combination of cell tower location and GPS triangulation is important. Um, so the things we're also thinking about when we're, we're creating the design patterns um, is like, what is, what is the real accuracy of this? So there was an interesting study that was done uh, last year that sort of showed um, that GPS devices are more accurate. Um, so they put up the iPod touch devices because they're doing Wi-Fi 
um, location as opposed to GPS location, geolocation, that you'd find in the phone. So basically saying nearly 60% of all Yelp check-ins were within 0.1 miles of the actual location on iPhones, um, but just 30% of the iPod touch check-ins were as accurate. And, uh, but surprisingly, the Android devices were closer in accuracy to an iPod touch, even though nearly all Android devices have GPS chips. So you can take whatever you want out of that. Um, I'm not a fanboy, but I do carry devices. I think it's just because I've been trained into them. Um, but I am interested um, in understanding how, it's, how these experiences are working um, on different platforms. So um, if, if, you, uh, if you can live with some tolerance for location data, Wi-Fi isn't, isn't horrible. And, uh, but there are times like I don't necessarily agree with that because like if I was walking around, I think I'd want a little bit better resolution um, than what I would get through Wi-Fi because it takes me about 20 minutes to walk a mile. And uh, if I was going to do a grid search on a square mile, that might take me quite a bit of time to figure out where I was going or where I needed to be. So all of this you know, works on a set of mapping coordinates. And location services and GPS mapping use systems that have been around for a long time, latitude and longitude, measured in degrees, minutes, and seconds. Um, and for the quick geography update for folks here, understanding which was the latitude and which was the longitude, and then how that maps to the Earth. Interestingly enough, did you know that the Earth is not a sphere? It is a biaxial ellipsoid, which means it's a little bit fatter around the equator. Talk about like planet body issues, right? <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> going on. Um, so why, why do I go through all this? Well, as, as a designer, and as I look at these patterns, you know, I'm really interested in the lingua franca of the, of the, of the technology. You know, I want to consider these systems and the ways in which our ability to create engaging experiences are not just X, Y, and Z anymore, right? Um, we have the geometry of the canvas, but the visual representation of temporal and location. Oh, yeah, and don't forget you want to reflect behavioral patterns. And oh, yeah, maybe you want to like tie magnitude into that. Um, so things are getting more complicated. And our job as designers is to define sort of the simplest solution out of all of this and to create the desired learning outcome. So I work with a guy named Gary Woodall. And Gary's a senior analyst. He works out of uh, Toronto. Very smart guy. And uh, we've been kicking around you know, this idea of design patterns. And design patterns really comes from the field of architecture. There's a guy named Christopher Alexander. Uh, he sort of coined the, the term of the technique in about 1975, 77. And he described it as a, as a problem that occurs over and over again in an environment. And then the core of the solution to that problem is crafted in the way that you can apply it again and again without ever doing it the same way twice. So um, Gary uh, has been kicking this around. And he came up with this statement of like, what is a pattern language? It's a set of design patterns that work together to generate more complex interrelated solutions. So this is also a really common. Uh, how many people are developers in here? And do some work, okay? So who's heard of the Gang of Fours? All right, you want me to quiz you on it? No? <laughs> I know, I'm the one doing the talking, yeah. So, um, uh, so the Gang of Fours is a really popular work that, uh, that talked about um, how you could really move through object-oriented programming and talked about sort of the creational, the structural, and the behavioral um, elements that are tied to programming, also similar to MVC. Um, there's a big, big part of that that's tied to it. Um, but essentially, it's, a, it's, it's really about like data and how relationships are made, how it's organized, how the data responds to each other, and then the formalization of those patterns um, as they can be applied. So it's kind of like you, know, you have this idea of patterns inside of architecture, and you have these patterns inside programming. And I think that's what I really become interested in as a designer, because a lot of times, like it, when I work on jobs, sometimes like, I'll go and talk to clients, and they're like, oh, yeah, you're just, it's just like the art, right? It's just like the art, you know, what is, what is the ornamentation, you know, as opposed to like what is the experience. So these structures and frameworks that we develop um, allow us to sort of understand how we can augment the thickness. So it always comes back to point of view again. I'll keep saying that over and over and over again. Um, but I began to investigate the patterns that were of interest to me in geolocation applications. And I realized that there's quite a different way in which the information is organized. 
And um, when Gary sort of went through his article and he was talking about design patterns, he came up with this list of sort of learning outcomes and then methods to sort of get to it. So within his table, the things that I wanted to focus on were sort of the was the discovery of new information through guided inquiry. And the social relationships and learning to work with others was sort of tangential. Those were topics that we had addressed inside of Tapestry and some of our other builds as well. Um, but Gary's framing was extremely helpful to me. So, you know, in the past, you know, there have been iconic ways in which we represent magnitude and location. So these are just a couple examples, you know, the juxtaposition of time to magnitude. And we see really traditional models here. We see timelines, we see spark lines, um, we see quadrant graphing, um, we see scaling. And uh, some of these translate really well to a small screen. Um, but we're finding that the component sets within the frameworks that we build with um, are a little bit more constrained than we would expect. And the synthesis of that when it comes to mapping is even tighter. Um, so the construction of our own personal location from the point of view is, is um, being determined not just by these frameworks, but by the software frameworks and then the hardware frameworks, the hardware platforms going on as well. So we've all looked at sort of like this interaction cycle, right? So, oops, I got a deck that's gotten away from me here. And the difference, if I can get this to hold, with this is that normally in the past, you know, our interaction practice counts upon um, input and the processing of that input based upon what the user does, right? So we click a button, some logic executes, and something else, something else comes out, right? Okay? The, the new paradigm um, still incorporates this idea of agency, like we do something to get a result, but that the updates are actually happening much more quickly, and they're, they're also sort of getting information from sensors, you know, the affordances of the device. And so, like, our outcomes are not just based upon the things that we're putting in, but on cloud data that's collected from a lot of other people. So a really simple example is traffic, right? So you can plot a route, right? And you can get an understanding of where you are and where you need to go, and, but that route doesn't really have value until you understand, like, is it efficient, you know, unless you get the rest of the information from the network. So these positional updates really only get value once they get mashed against sort of a corpus of other significant data. They don't exist by themselves anymore. And so these geolocation apps and the way we design them um, really need to be approached as being stateful, all right? They're always in a, a state of change, uh, always in a state of flux. So within iOS, you know, there are really standard patterns that come up over and over and over again. So, you know, Google Maps came online, I think it was about 2005, like that's when it was, that's when it was published. And, uh, you know, we're getting to a standard in the way that, that location is really represented. Um, the first Google Maps mashup, does anyone know what it was? Any ideas? It was a piece, uh, some people say it was housingmaps.com, which was a matchup, mashup of Craigslist and uh, a mashup of Google Maps. You'd think it was like hookups, right? Like that would have been the first one. <laughs> Google Glass, anyone? Um, so uh, it was actually a hack solution, too, that uh, the Google Maps were not even published at that point. It was, he had actually gone into the database and uh, pulled the information out. So, um, but with iOS, you know, there's a whole new map system that Apple is using with it. So uh, we do a lot of our work in iOS, especially for prototyping, because it sort of limits uh, the edge cases and the things you have to think about when you're launching on a lot of platforms. Um, but I think these design patterns are sort of coming out across all the different devices. Um, and that's good and bad, right? Because in some ways, we can get to ideas, but in other ways, we're sort of pushing the same design and efficiencies forward. And um, I, I worry about that a lot. Like, am I just sort of like reinventing the same thing over and over again, or, or is what am, I, what am I doing really adding value. And so if you look at this sort of first view, right, you get what you think is a map, but like what, what you really have, in essence, is, is a list view, 
Like everything seems like with views inside of iOS this day, you know, it's a list view for some reason. Like these components, they just feel so similar. And um, I think that what I've tried to do is to look out at other applications. So, you know, I pulled a couple examples for you. Um, Waze, Glimpse, and TomTom. -Tom. And anyone use these before? Any of these look familiar? Yeah, okay. So um, Waze is a, is a crowdsourced routing tool. It was the first sort of public turn-by-turn -turn navigation tool before Apple came out with theirs. Um, and uh, Glimpse is a uh, time sort of release location tool. So you can say, hey, I'm, I'm gonna let people know where I am. It's sort of like Snapchat with a clock um, in position, you know, to go along with it. And TomTom uh, -tom is the really traditional sort of wayfinding, you know, routing application that you'd see out there. So what I do as a designer is like, I have to get rid of the sparkle so I can begin to understand what's really there. So um, then I begin to look at, okay, what are the commonalities? And so like when I did this, I'm like, you know, this is, this is kind of interesting because like all the metadata, like the meta routing stuff, it started to have almost like the same screen real estate to it. Um, it was mashed maybe in a different axis, but it was interesting like the weighting of the content was becoming very similar. And the, it was even, even throughout these apps, it was still very text heavy, text heavy um, in the description. And um, I began to sort of, you know, parse through the other modes, like how do I get there? So within ways, um, you know, the first is really dependent upon the personality of the route and the iconography, you know, is it happy, is it sad, is it fast or slow? And the second is sort of more personal because it ties in a relationship over here. And the third, the point of view is completely generic, all right? It's just your point of view, but there is no personalization going on whatsoever. Once again, sort of pulling it out. And then begin to see that in isolation, the number of data points that I sort of need to have to understand how do I get from here to there. So within Waze, you know, you sort of have a beginning and an end. With a Glimpse, it's sort of a target approach. You are vectoring in on this place. This is, you know, like a missile sort of coming in on it. Whereas with TomTom, -Tom, in this view, it was tracking along a vector, okay, so it was really different. And then finally, within these renderings, understanding of sort of how am I progressing, the feedback methods change with, you know, the voice uh, routing inside of ways, sort of text updating where, again, we're understanding where people are, not really locations. And then the third, again, which is more generic. So as I looked at those, you know, none of them were really helping me get to where I wanted to do with the app design and understanding like how I was gonna sort of have my personal experience be more important. So the most influential piece that I actually found was, let me bop through this for a second, was Instagram. And here we have the photo maps example inside of Instagram. And the reason I love this is that it has the image, you know, what's important to me, and then it also has representation of magnitude, right? What's the number? How important is that location to me? So as we got to the point where we wanted to actually create the application, we're thinking, okay, you know, this, this gets us to where we, we think we wanna be. So I wanted to jump over real quick and talk about Wayflyer, Wayfiler. And uh, this is, again, Chad's idea. And uh, the whole idea was to come up with a system that used a lot of existing tools that are out there. So it's built on MongoDB, a uh, cloud-based um, database, and uh, it connects a variety of services. And so on the iPhone, um, you have these things called core location and then map kit. And uh, core location is the thing that interprets the sensor data, all right? And um, you actually, uh, there are some really unique ways in which you call that sensor information. You don't want to be doing it all the time because it'll kill your battery life on your device. Um, and then MapKit is the thing that sort of indexes and does the reverse lookup. And then finally, core data in the center is where everything is cached so you're not making calls out to the network all the time. And then you have a Dropbox repository where you can actually store your files. So I got this here, but I think if I can, 
I'll actually show you the app. Um, we have it in beta, and let's see if I can get it here. Okay, so here it is. And, you know, we wanted to make something that was bloody simple. So when you log in, um, the first thing you can do is say tag nearby. So here I am, and I'm at State College, and I can begin to look for files that have been placed and stored. Now, there's a lot of similarities to this to other applications that you'll find out there, but the unique um, things that you'll find are the different file types that you can use, the ability to link the system into basically any authentication framework that you want. Right now, um, like I said, it's just tied to, um, it is just tied to uh, my Dropbox account personally. And I can sort of do a radial search so I can look at things that are within uh, five miles of me or further. And then I can pop in and actually look at those placements there. And then if I click on them, um, I can see some metadata about that. And it's my girlfriend in Hawaii. <laughs> so um, I just was looking for an image to post. And it's pretty interesting because we had a lot of different use cases that we imagined for this. And uh, we were joking with our accountant because she's pretty straight laced about her storing all her Grateful Dead shows um, and geofencing and then sort of having them release with time, um, which Denise would never do. But uh, the use cases are um, pretty wide. You know, we have clients like in agronomy that would think about sort of placing field information uh, and locating, you know, uh, uh, information about uh, GIS uh, or, or rainfall. Um, and then we also have um, the idea of possibly using it for safety briefings. You know, you'd be tying it to the location of specific devices. Um, so you'd have additional elements that would augment your performance support systems. Um, and the great thing about Dropbox is that it actually um, has a lot of meta types that you can view. So you can view movies, music, and that's really different. And it's, and it's agnostic. And the great thing is it's your data, right? So all that Wayfiler does is create that metadata layer over the top. It says, where is it? And then you can share it out with the different people as you go along. So um, I think, you know, the app will continue to develop over time, and we hope to release it out in the public in the next two weeks. It will most likely be 99 cents, or it'll probably be free, actually, when we send it out there. We're gonna go to uh, mLearnCon shortly, which is a big uh, mobile learning conference, and I think we'll probably end up just giving it away while we're out there. So if you want, you can check it out and download it. Um, and so what's next? Like, what do we think about next? Um, well, we're thinking more about cloud data, thinking about behavioral patterns and how it is going to drive adaptive design. Responsive design, which you guys have probably gotten hammered into your head like a thousand times today or yesterday as well. But at the, at the macro, the thing as a developer and as a designer is really about keeping those edge cases in check. Like when you think about breaking new ground, you know, the idea of just shipping it becomes really important, you know? You have to understand when you're doing research versus when you're releasing stuff into the wild. And so with this kind of stuff, it's like, no, we're gonna make it because it's the best possible concept. And we're not going to worry about the edge case of like, well, what if it doesn't run you know, on this device or that device? And then the other things we keep looking at are haptics. Like what other type of feedback responses are we going to get um, out of our phones and how it's actually gonna integrate with our car, um, with our multi-screen uh, world that we actually live in. So with that, we also have a new book. This will be a chapter inside of that. I really appreciate you guys giving me a chance to talk a little bit about what I do and what I do with Float. And um, I hope the rest of the conference is informative and engaging. Thank you.